Okay, so just as an update, there's some administrative issues for the course. Um, Assignment 5 is, is now three out of the five questions are posted. I'll post the next two today. Uh, they're going to be related to the material I'm covering today's class. Um, that assignment is due a little bit later than I originally had up. I had Friday originally, but I thought since I'm posting some of these questions um, today only, I'll give you until Monday to hand it in the assignment. And, uh, because there's no class though next week for 4 a.m., um, please just put that assignment in the drop box by, by Monday afternoon. Uh, so Lynn leaves the office at 4 o'clock and she clears out the drop box at 4 o'clock. So make sure that it's in, in, in there by that time. So Daryl can start grading it and uh, you might be able to get it back before the exam. Uh, yes, Simon 4, Daryl's finishing that up today, so I'll have that in class tomorrow for you to pick up. I do have the midterms, so any of you that didn't or weren't able to pick up your midterm last week, please uh, come at the end and just collect it for me. And then finally, um, or two other things rather, there's the uh, course evaluations for all the courses are being run electronically this year, as you, as you, as you heard in other classes, I'm sure. Uh, this is phenomenally important for me. Um, I take these extremely seriously, as, as you know, for the mid, the mid course, midterm course evaluation I ran, and this final one um, is, is very helpful for shaping this course, especially since uh, I've overhauled this course. Um, I'm interested to see what your feedback is on, on how it's gone so far. Um, I know that we've also messed up the grading a little bit by dropping the take home exam, so some people were a little bit confused about the allocation of where their grades would go. Um, what two, two things related to that is, please use that grading spreadsheet that's there online to check how the system works. Now, I've described this in class before. Essentially, we're dropping the take-home exam, and that 10% is either being reallocated to the final exam or it's being spread evenly over the rest of the course. I will check both options, and then I'll pick whichever one gets you the higher grade. But because that type of if-then-else thing is so messy, Avenue has no way of computing your course grade. And you cannot handle such a complicated formula for computing grades. So please don't read anything into the averages and symbols calculated in Avenue. Use that spreadsheet that's on the course website, um, and that's how I'll be allocating the grade for you. Um, and then finally, the final class for this course is on Friday. I'll be doing a review class uh, that covers all the material we've looked at. I'll bring it all together for you and show you how the pieces fall together. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the final exam in that class as well. Any other issues regarding this course? Um, so if there is anything that you want to talk about, anything you want to, uh, to mention in class on Friday or, or uh, questions that you have, please email them to me or use the, the course feedback site and then I can make sure to address them in Friday's class. So I, this section here I've, is on drying. Um, I've, when I was restructuring this course um, in July, when I just started here, I was looking at how it was taught in the past. And in the past, drying was taught near the beginning of the term, and then other topics were, were rearranged. So I was looking at it, and it didn't really make sense to teach it right at the beginning. As you'll see in today's class, a lot of the concepts that come through here in drying rely on a good understanding of what cyclones are, um, there's multiple ways actually to dehydrate a product. We've looked at several of them. One is you could use filtration in, in the same style as we saw in membranes. You could use centrifuges. Um, all of those are steps that eliminate or reduce the amount of water in solid products. But this step here today that we're considering is where we're trying to approach even greater levels of dryness. So filtering, um, the centrifuges will get you a solid product that you've eliminated some of the moisture, but there's still plenty of water left. Now we're saying we'd like to take that a step further, and this step, drying, is, is the final separation step in many uh, flow sheets. So it's a good way to end off the course as well, because it's the last separating step you'll see in many, in many instances. So in pharmaceuticals, we see this a lot. Um, <laughs> if you walk into a pharmaceutical manufacturing suite, um, the dryer is the thing that looks like a big washing machine. Okay, it's literally just like a big tumble dryer that's there in the corner. Um, the hole is about this big and they just shove the tablets in there and they just spin them around and it's, it's just like a big tumble dryer. Foods, um, those are often dry batch-wise systems. 
Uh, we'll look at some of the equipment in the class on Thursday. I'll have some diagrams. Uh, crops, grains, and cereal products, those are often dehydrated. I'll talk about why in a minute. Lumber, um, so any of you who've worked with 2x4s have heard that you don't just go to Home Depot, buy a 2x4 and use it in your home. You let it equilibrate and settle a bit at, in the environment that you're going to use it because if you don't, that wood is going to warp. You're changing the, the relative humidity, the environment that it's in, that lumber will warp. Uh, especially if it's come off the back of a truck from Quebec where it's snowy and cold and got moisture that's embedded in the grains of the wood, you want it to equilibrate in, in your house first before you go ahead and use it. Uh, because those pores absorb the wood and change and change the structure of the, of the wood and will cause it to warp. So drying is an important step in lumber production uh, and they spend a lot of money on drying that, that, that final wood before it's shipped. Um, we'll see it a lot in chemicals, fine chemical production especially. Um, you're all familiar with your chemistry classes where you've seen, for example, copper sulfate CuSO4 dark 5H2O or dark 1H2O. Um, so there's that, that water that's attached to some of these fine chemicals. And in some instances we want to drive that water off without changing the chemical and crystal structure. And then an important drying step that's uh, done is in detergents. So to create a good flowability um, washing powder that you add if you, if you use powdered washing um, powder that, that's, that's dry in the final step. So we dry these, these many products that we consume and use for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons is because of the reduction of weight in shipping. So we, we really don't want to spend money shipping water around. So if we can drive that water off, it's, it's often more economical to do that first and then ship the product. But the other major reason is trying to package a moist product is, is really difficult. Um, there's all sorts of issues on sealing that product up. Um, it's harder to manage and flow around through a chemical process if it's got moisture in it. So we ideally would like to dry off that moisture first and then have an, a, a solid product that's easier to flow and manipulate. And then for food products, moisture in your food is uh, a vector for bacterial growth, so we want to eliminate that. And then it also stabilizes the food and tastes if we can, if we can eliminate the, the water first. Other, other foods are uh, dried for not only those reasons, but for preserving flavor and uh, eliminating bacterial growth, but also they impart desirable characteristics to the food, so crispiness and crunchiness in, um, so for example, potato snacks. No one wants to bite into a soggy chip. Right? There's nothing that's less satisfying than biting into a soggy Dorito or something like that. So you really want that crispy flavor, uh, uh, that crispy, um, and they're called organoleptic properties. So all those properties you experience in your mouth, that crunch you feel in your jaw, the vibrations that get set up in your, in your skull when you're biting into a good, good crispy piece of toast, that's all uh, organoleptic properties and they come from drying. And then finally, uh, in some products, especially those products that are shipped in metal containers, drying is important to eliminate corrosion because in the same way that you get the fire triangle, you need three components for fire. There's the same idea for corrosion. You need a metal, you need an electro potential, and then you need moisture. So if we can eliminate one of those, the moisture components, we can uh, eliminate or reduce corrosion. So for many of those reasons, we, we, we need to dry our product. Now, uh, let's just take a look at understanding uh, the equilibrium relationships here. For all products, we can set up isotherms. Okay? So this is why I covered adsorption prior to this, because we need to understand what the isotherms are. Uh, here's essentially the isotherms or the equilibrium relationship between various materials, moisture, and the and the moisture that's bound onto that product. So let's take a look, for example, at cotton. So the line for cotton over there shows what the equilibrium moisture content locked up in that cotton matrix is at various levels of ambient humidity. So if I take a cotton t-shirt or raw cotton uh, that's just harvested and I put it in an environment with 40% uh, ambient relative humidity, I'll define what that is in a minute, but um, you're probably familiar with humidity from your second year course. That cotton will equilibrate 
and have five kilograms of water locked up in it per 100 kilograms of carbon. Okay, so after a long period of time, that, that's the amount of water that would be embedded in the carbon. In higher levels of humidity, so 80%, that moves to almost about nine kilograms. Now, obviously, that cotton, um, if I brought in cotton t-shirts or uh, material that had just that I just wet, I just made wet from tap or in some other manner, that level of water that's in the cotton is going to be up here, for example. So a wet t-shirt just pulled up from the washing machine may have 20 kilograms of water per 100 kilograms of cotton. But what this graph is saying is in an environment at 20 degrees and 40% humidity, if I leave that t-shirt there, just in the environment, after a long period of time, the water on the cotton will naturally go up into the environment, and the equilibrium amount of water remaining on the cotton is five kilos. I cannot get below five kilograms unless I do something extra to the system. By adding heat into the system and driving off that ex excess moisture, I can now go below this equilibrium relation, uh, below that equilibrium curve. But Without adding any energy separating agent into the system, I'm going to equilibrate at 5 uh, kilograms per 100 kilograms of material. So the value then on that curve is what we call the bound moisture. That's the moisture that's adsorbed, AD, adsorbed into the materials, capillaries, and surfaces. So it's naturally embedded in, the, in, the, in that material and taken up from the environment. So provided the environment has 40% humidity, that material is going to continually take up water until it equilibrates at that, at that point. Okay, so at that point, the vapor pressure is below the water's partial pressure at this temperature. So I'll define what that means in a minute. Um, so the vapor pressure, remember, is the pressure that, that the liquid on the surface of the material is pressuring it is got against the environment itself, against the gas phase. So we can be above this though, above that point 0.5, as I said earlier, if I took the cotton and I just soaked it in water, I'm obviously going to have more moisture in there. And we call that additional amount of, of uh, moisture, free moisture. So it's the, whatever's in excess of the equilibrium. Okay, so the bound moisture is this distance from the bottom up to the, uh, up to the isotherm. And then the, the free moisture is any moisture wherever we are above that line is the amount of free moisture that we have. Okay. So as, as expected, all materials pretty much um, will have a value of zero. So in an environment where there's no humidity, which is almost impossible to obtain naturally, um, uh, the equilibrium amount of moisture trapped in, in that um, solid will tend to zero. Essentially just saying that the moisture is all just going to be driven off into this uh, zero humidity environment and it's going to essentially land up being what we call bone dry. So bone dry is a technical term that you see in the drying literature. It refers to a material where 100% of the moisture has been driven off the material. So to understand drying, we need to understand the heat and mass transfer that's taking place. There's two, uh, both are occurring simultaneously, and they're occurring in two directions. So we'll, we're, this, is, this is the critical part to understand about drying, is that there's mass transfer and heat transfer. The mass transfer occurs by taking the liquid that's embedded in the solid and moving it out from the interior of the product to the surface. So if the, if the product is porous, like sand, or, or a fine chemical, that water is embedded inside the pores of the, of the solid. We need to move that liquid from the interior out to the surface. At the surface, or near to it, we need to vaporize that liquid phase water into the vapor or gas phase, and then transport that vapor, that water vapor, into the bulk of gas. So mass transfer is from the solid interior out to the bulk environment. So that's the direction of mass transfer. Heat transfer is in the opposite direction. In order to get that vaporization occurring, we need some energy to go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. We need that heat of vaporization, that energy, kilojoules per kilogram, 
uh, water needs to be provided by the heat source. So that's coming from the bulk gas phase. We're putting a hot stream of air around the solid, and we're using the heat from that air to heat up the material and drive off the moisture. That heat goes into two, um, into two types that we call latent heat and sensible heat. So this is uh, something that we're familiar with from uh, our physics or chemistry courses. The latent heat then is that heat of vaporization. Latent heat refers to heat that causes a phase change without causing a temperature change in the product. So it's simply the heat that's used to make the water vapor go from its liquid form to a vapor form without changing the temperature of the water. So part of that uh, heat transfer from the bulk gas is used uh, up as latent heat. Then there's the sensible heat. That's the heat that we add in excess to the amount of latent heat, and which we will end up doing. Uh, we'll always add in excess heat that starts to heat up the solid as well. Okay, so it's the same principle as when you're drying clothes in your dryer, and you're adding energy into the clothes, not only to dry off the water from liquid phase to vapor phase, but your clothes end up coming out the dryer warmer than, um, than what they started off with. Okay, so we end up adding excess heat to our solid, and that's sensible heat. Sensible heat refers to the fact that we could recover it. Um, so that heated solid, we could in some way recover that heat from it, but in, in general that heat is so, so small that it's, it's not economically feasible to do so. But we end up heating up our solid. So this heat goes into these two Two locations. So heat transfers from the gas into the solid, mass transfers from the solid into the gas. So it's these complementary directions. Okay, so then the rest of the class today really is just a recap of these psychrometric charts and some of these physical chemistry concepts that we've learned about previously. And then tomorrow's, uh, sorry, Thursday's class, I'll look at the equipment for drying and we'll look at sizing a preliminary uh, units for drying. And that's about all we have time for in this, in this course. The, and I'll, I'll explain why I'm covering such a limited amount of material in the, in the, in the class on Thursday. So let's just recap the terminology. A lot of this may be familiar for you, but let's, uh, let's all just make sure we're on the same um, understanding here. And if this is still unfamiliar by the end of today's class, I would recommend that you go through this material uh, today or tomorrow to make sure that you understand these the terms coming up in the next few slides. So here's the phase diagram for water. Carl and Chad showed the phase diagram for CO2 a little bit later, that, uh, earlier. That's why I, I decided to have these two classes simultaneously. It, it relies on the understanding of where we are on this pressure and temperature axis over here. Um, we're familiar with the fact that water at this zero degrees uh, point is, in fact, zero degrees in one atmosphere exists as ice, so it's the freezing point of water. If we heat that ice up to 100 degrees C, we, we get water. So this is the environment that we're used to dealing with water in every day. What we're looking at here in the drying part of this course is we want to go from the liquid phase down to the vapor phase. Okay, so the uh, one way to do that is to by lowering the pressure. And we're, we're familiar with that concept that if you draw a vacuum on, onto a solid, you can start to drive off the water from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. But the, that, that has an associated cost with it. The other way though we can go from liquid to vapor is by moving horizontally. And that's the way we would typically go, is by simply heating up the environment at constant pressure. Um, so we move them from the liquid phase move the liquid to the vapor phase. So either one of those could work. In general though, the costs of going along horizontally by adding heat are cheaper than by drawing a vacuum. Uh, drawing a vacuum has some, obviously some operating costs, but also the capital costs of the physical unit and the strength of that unit uh, can be prohibitive. Whereas operating at atmospheric temperatures and just simply heating the product up, moving horizontally, can be uh, far more economical. So we tend to see, uh, see this happening, though it's, there's no reason why we could. Um, and in practice, we do, for some drying operations, we do simply just draw a vacuum because the product is temperature sensitive. So for, for some food-based products uh, that will degrade based on temperature, we would rather draw a vacuum onto it and 
go from liquid phase to vapor phase than to try and heat up the product. Some products also, when we increase the temperature, the product's physical characteristics start to break down. Uh, they they uh, form fines that are undesirable, or they, the product just physically degrades. So drawing a, a, a vacuum on there would be uh, a way to dry the product rather than by increasing the temperature. Okay, so that's where we are. Let's take a look now at some terminology then. Just a quick recap of partial pressure and vapor pressure. So partial pressure is something that we're very comfortable with. We've seen it so many times in chemical engineering, it's second hand. Uh, it's the pressure that we have in the, in the gas phase due to one of the components. So in this case, we're only looking at water and, and, uh, and air mixtures. So in that simple case, that binary case, the partial pressure due to water is the uh, essentially the mole fraction of water in the vapor phase is what it comes, comes down to. So the vapor phase with uh, no water in it, so that partial pressure of water is zero. As we add water into the system, the amount of pressure that just due to the water vapor we call the partial pressure. And that's easy to measure in a laboratory uh, type equipment. Vapor pressure, on the other hand, is the pressure exerted on the solid I'm sorry, from the solid phase, that liquid water that's sitting at the surface or in the, in the pores of the solid is exerting a pressure on the gas phase and trying to escape into the gas phase. So uh, vapor pressure then you can interpret as that pressure of the material trying to get into the gas phase essentially is a measure of its volatility. Substances with high vapor pressures we would term very volatile. So alcohols have high vapor pressure, they, they will go into, into the vapor phase very readily. Uh, other liquids like oils don't have a very high vapor pressure at all. They're, uh, they stay predominantly in the liquid phase. So the key thing for evaporation and drying is that from a wet solid, we only get evaporation occurring when the vapor pressure exceeds the partial pressure. So when we have enough pressure from that material on the solid surface to push against the vapor phase, that's the only time we will get dry. Okay, so if we don't meet that criteria, we will not have material evaporate into, into the vapor phase. And the other, other conclusion that you can get from this is that at equilibrium, these two are happening in even amounts. So there's as much material going into the liquid phase, condensing back into the liquid phase, as there is evaporating from the liquid back into the vapor. So backwards and forwards uh, going uh, is, is, is an even amount. So you'll often see this if you look at, um, if you take like a half full water bottle and it's in the fridge, or, or not even in the fridge, just as long as the screw cap is on the water bottle and it's half full, you'll see condensing water on the top edge of on the interior of the water bottle. That's in equilibrium. That liquid is going into the vapor phase and condensing back onto the surface at the same rate. Those two, um, those two are taking place. So let's take a look at the psychrometric chart. So everyone's got one now? Let's, uh, let's just take a quick recap of, of how to use them. So this is a fairly simplified one. Some of the the charts online and have far more lines on them. Let's, let's just take a look though at, at the parts we need. I've, I've purposefully chosen the simplified one so we can uh, just build up our knowledge here again. So two important uh, variables plotted on the x and y axis, temperature and humidity. So that x axis temperature is what we call um, the, well I'll define it in a minute, but the y axis here is humidity h. So if you would like to just correct that H there on the side, I'll call it Psi, briefly as Psi for, uh, for this class. And it's measured as the kilograms of water vapor per kilograms of dry air. So if I have one kilogram of dry air, H the humidity is the amount of water vapor in addition to that one kilogram of dry air. The temperature axis then is this usual temperature that you, you, you're uh, comfortable with measuring. And we call that the dry bulb temperature to be more specific. Okay, so that's, there's nothing new there on that. That's the standard temperature that you measure uh, with an ordinary thermometer, the dry bulb temperature. That's what's on the horizontal axis. 
The vertical axis, humidity, there's that three letter side that I'll use. Uh, it's the mass of water vapor per mass of dry air. Now, the reason why I've, I've moved to psi rather than H is some textbooks use psi as humidity, and that's to avoid confusing with enthalpy, which is also H. So whenever we're talking about these, these psychometric charts, the enthalpy is also an important variable that comes into play. And everyone always gets confused with which H is which H. So let's avoid that and just call humidity psi and enthalpy will be H. Now please note there that the units for humidity do not cancel. It's kilograms over kilograms, but it's not a dimension, it's quantity. These are two different types of kilograms. Kilograms water vapor over kilograms dry air. Now, the next important part of this diagram is the um, saturation humidity. So at a particular temperature, let's say 50 degrees, I can have essentially dry air with no humidity. So at that point over there. And then as I humidify that air, add water vapor to the air, there's a, there's a certain maximum amount of humidity or water that that air can hold. Beyond that, there's no possible way of, of adding more water to that air. So at 50 degrees, that maximum that I reach is at this 100% percentage humidity line. And I can determine what that mass of water is by reading horizontally across, and it's roughly 0 0.075, 0, 0 0.076 kilograms of water vapor per kilogram of dry air is the maximum amount of water vapor that I can hold in that air at 50 degrees C. So that's my saturation humidity, simply by moving vertically up to that, up to that line. Then the percentage humidity, which is the amount uh, that's plotted there actually on the curve, is simply the ratio between the kilograms of water uh, held over the maximum that you can hold. So psi over psi s is then this percentage humidity curve. The actual humidity is what's on the, on the y-axis, um, but then the percentage humidity is then shown there as those parametric lines um, at 2, 5, 10, increasing percentages. Okay, so both, we get two, two measures of humidity, the humidity vertically on the y-axis and then these curved lines, the percentage or relative, uh, percentage humidity. Now, remember we said that partial pressure is the amount of pressure in the, of the total pressure that's due to the water vapor. So if I've got a two-component system, I've got water and air in my vapor phase. So the total pressure is due to the partial pressure due to water and the partial pressure due to the air. Those two sum up to the total pressure, capital P. These psychometric charts are drawn at, at certain pressures. I've uh, colored the label, but you have it here on uh, the bottom of your, of your chart. It specifically says that this is the psychometric chart at the given pressure, atmospheric in this case. So you could redraw this chart at, at, at differing pressures. So the, our total pressure in, the, in this plot is atmospheric. You can only use this plot if your system is operating at ambient conditions. If you're operating in a pressurized vessel, you would need to consult one of these other, uh, other graphs, and there's plenty of them available online to, to get the updated psychometric chart at higher pressures. So let's call capital P then the total pressure of our system. PA is the partial pressure due to uh, the water vapor, and then the rest of that, P minus PA, is the partial pressure due to the air components in the system. So what I can do then is I can also express humidity. I've done express humidity up here in terms of kilograms of water vapor per kilograms of dry air. But what I can do is I can take, bring that down here, mass of water vapor over mass of dry air. If I use the molar masses of air and water, I can express that then as the moles of water vapor over the moles of dry air. And then by using the ideal gas law, I can relate those moles to the pressure. So I haven't done the calculation, but you can prove it to yourself that if I plug in the ideal gas law here, remember we're only dealing with a vapor phase system, the number of, I can convert these to moles of water vapor or the moles of dry air. The pressure is constant. The R, the ideal gas law, R and T are, are the same, and they will cancel out in the numerators and denominators, and you can end up by showing that 
is the ratio of the partial pressure of water divided by the remaining partial pressure of oil. In other words, the partial pressure due to air, and then multiply by those two molar masses of the air and water respectively. So humidity can also be expressed in terms of the partial pressures. But for our purposes, it's more convenient to express humidity in terms of the masses of water and masses of dry air. So that's the, that's the definition I would tend to, tend to use. And it's also the, the one that's on the y-axis over here. OK, so everyone comfortable with this plot now? So this is, this is just a recap of, of second year material. We, we really need to be uh, comfortable with this. We're going to use this then in class on, on Thursday to design these systems. So here then, the, one, uh, one other definition is the dew point temperature that we need to be clear about. This is the temperature that if you take a, a parcel of air and you cool it down, it's the temperature at which you just start to see uh, condensation occur. Or in other words, you move, you, you, let's take, uh, in this example, I'm taking air at 65 degrees C and 10% humidity. So 65 degrees. I just read up to 10%, so make sure that you can follow this on your plot. Uh, please be aware that these uh, partitions along the x-axis are in steps of 2.5 degrees C. They're not in steps of 2 degrees, they're in 2.5 degree steps. So at 65 degrees C, I read up to the 10% line. That gives me my air at 65 degrees C and 10% humidity. The dew point temperature then is if I took the air at those conditions and I cooled it down from 65, so I just kept pressure the same and cooled that air down, that amount of water that's in, the, in that stays the same. I'm not, I've, I've locked up this into, into a closed system and I'm simply just cooling it down to 25 degrees C is where I'll start to see my first droplets of condensation forming. That's my dew point. Um, and essentially at 25 degrees C then I now have air and water mixture that's 100% saturated. So I, I reach my saturation point by moving along and then that whatever temperature I land at, that, that's my dew point, called my dew point temperature. There's one other temperature that we need to, to, uh, to talk about, um, but in order to define that temperature we first need to talk about another Concept. So this is one that you may not have seen in the second year. This is what we'll call the humid heat. This is essentially, um, you can see it as the heat capacity of an air and water mixture. And it essentially is defined as the sum of the heat capacity. So if I consider one kilogram of, of dry air, and that kilogram of air also contains water vapor. So I've got one kilogram of dry air, and in addition to that one kilogram, I've got a certain amount of water that's carried in that, in that dry air. So I've just got over one kilogram of, of gas phase material. I'm asking how much energy do I need to add to that one point something kilograms of material in order to raise that parcel of air-water mixture by one degree C. So that's essentially the definition of heat capacity. And because I'm recognizing that this material is made up of both air and moisture, that humid heat, Cs, that heat capacity, then is the sum of the two heat capacities. The 1.005 is the heat capacity of dry air. Um, and as I said, it says in the region that we're working in, that, that constant is, is will remain. Um, and then we also have the heat capacity of water vapor. But we need to multiply it by the humidity. So 1.88 is kilojoules per kilogram of water vapor multiplied by psi. Psi, remember, is kilograms of water vapor per kilograms of dry air. So the kilograms of water vapor cancels out, and I'm essentially left with the sum of two terms which have the same units, kilojoules per kilogram dry air Kelvin. So this formula up here tells me the heat capacity of a water gas, or sorry, the water vapor mixture, uh, water air vapor mixture, I should say, water and air uh, vapor mixture to heat up that mixture by 1 degree C. So that's a, uh, a definition we need, and we're going to use that in the next one to estimate the adiabatic saturation temperature. So this is the temperature. Um, let's take a look at defining it in terms of this, this hypothetical system. So if we consider a system as follows, where I've got an inlet gas with a certain humidity, 
and a certain temperature T. So the humidity psi and temperature T. So I'm bringing this, temperature, uh, this gas in to a closed system where I'm going to contact it with water vapor that finally missed it out. So I'm spraying water vapor, uh, sorry, I'm spraying liquid water, I should say. And then this gas stream is contacting this liquid water. That liquid water is going to be taken up by this gas. And then we're going to leave then with a different humidity, psi s and t s. So the gas comes in at psi and it comes in at t. It's going to leave then with a raised humidity, psi s. And I'm going to add more moisture to this uh, to this humidity, to this uh, inlet gas. So whatever that humidity is, I'm going to add more to it, and I'm going to leave the psi s. Then I've got it coming in at temperature T, and it's going to leave at Ts. So Ts we expect to be lower than T. This is an adiabatic system, so that, in other words, there's no energy being added or removed here. So the energy can vaporize this liquid phase into the vapor and have it leave here, that energy, that heat of vaporization must come from the system itself. And we do that by cooling down T, down to Ts. So this is a hypothetical system where we're contacting liquid and we're making sure that we contact it so that we reach equilibrium. So we're reaching equilibrium in the system. That temperature then leaving Ts it's the same temperature as this water that's being recycled around here. So we're in thermal equilibrium. And we're also in equilibrium where the amount of water that's being held by this outlet matches the maximum amount of water, the saturation amount that can be held. So that size is that saturation amount. And the energy, as I've said, comes from the system itself. So we're reducing this temperature of the inlet water down to Ts. So if we do an enthalpy balance on the system, uh, we've got, remember enthalpy balances, we always need to choose some form of reference point. So here it's convenient that we choose as our reference that saturation temperature Ts. If we do that, by that choice of temperature as, a, as my reference, I essentially get to disregard water from the system because water is a Ts throughout that system, so I can drop water out from consideration. So then let's just take a look at the vapor phase. We're now doing an enthalpy balance on the vapor in and the vapor leaving. So vapor comes in at a temperature T, T minus T ref, that's, and, and it just happens that I've chosen my reference temperature to be Ts. So T minus the reference temperature of Ts multiplied by the humid heat. That's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of this gas water mixture to temperature T, plus the amount of enthalpy required to get it into the vapor phase. So that's this heat of vaporization, is that amount of energy? Kilojoules per kilogram, but then how many kilograms of water do I have? Well, I have psi, kilograms of water per kilograms of dry air. So the enthalpy of my stream coming in is given by that those two components combined. The enthalpy of the vapor leaving is at Ts, so in this case Ts minus T, my reference, that term goes to zero, but then the enthalpy leaving is a different psi, it's the humidified psi, the psi s. Okay. By equating those two enthalpies, I can show um, this equation over here so you can derive it, but what why we've chosen this particular format is that it gets me my y-axis over my x-axis on the psychrometric chart. So my rate of change of psi over my rate of change of temperature. And essentially those are the diagonal of these slope lines that you see on the psychrometric chart. So these diagonal lines are those uh, is given by that equation over there. So here I've, I've added this in and we'll take this up tomorrow from this point. So I'm essentially coming in with humidity psi and temperature T, and I'm going to move diagonally along this line to a new saturation psi S and T S. 